Titus, I'm bored. What plaything can you offer me today? An obscure body in the SK system, Your Majesty. The inhabitants refer to it as the planet Earth. How peaceful it looks. Hello, lovelies. Uh, so, some housekeeping, I suppose. Uh, table topless, we have a new player who has begun joining us. So, if you fancy seeing them, um, you can check out the recorded videos on tabletopless.org. Uh, or join us live on Tuesday nights, though we're mixing things up a bit uh, recently, so doing different things on different nights, and I get one night off, <laughs> one Tuesday off, which is nice. Um, we also have a new Safe for Work project with Tabletopless, so it's a new project uh, based on the Cypher system, which will be somewhat being designed live. Um, as as we play it and as we generate characters and so on uh, that'll most likely be on youtube for streaming uh, and playback because twitch are whiny pussies and basically if you're involved in adult work or you mention that you're involved in adult work in any way on twitch they seem to just randomly uh, ban you even if you're not doing or saying anything naughty on Twitch itself. Uh, yes, the double standards <laughs> are real uh, and a problem for people who want to use Twitch to stream. Whether we will end up multi-streaming to other platforms uh, remains to be seen, um, but certainly streaming to larger, more competent platforms like YouTube, uh, will be a bit of a relief, I think, after all the technical issues that you can run into streaming to adult sites, and uh, they all have their own weird rules as well. Um, we got called up uh, a couple of weeks ago because there was a, was a static image of a dog on, on screen where I was uh, describing hunting dogs and used a visual reference, and that was, that was bad and wrong, apparently. <laughs> So, man, online places and their rules are just are so weird. Uh, I'm still working on Ronin, but I'm stalled on it. I've got no design or writing or creative mojo lately, which is why there's been so many reviews. Uh, and while I was working on Ronin, several similar games came out. Then I had all the art problems. So I'm just kind of meh. Uh, I'm trying to do more reviews so I can get ahead on videos so that I can just work on Ronin and overcome that hump and slump and, uh, and get it done. And also so I can take advantage of the recent good weather to get some exercise again. My medication changes ha have helped the pain and other problems that I've had, even though they've brought my cough back. So, you know, I want to take advantage of that and shed some of the pounds <laughs> that unfortunately tend to pile up um, when you can't exercise and also when you're taking antidepressants that can cause weight gain. So, yes, I'm not quite as svelte as the upper part of my torso might make it appear. <laughs> uh, Dungeons and Discussions will be back soonish over the summer. So that's over on t the Historian's channel. So go subscribe there, please. He's nearly at a thousand. It would mean the world to him if he was monetized. So go and sub with every account that you have, please. And do tune in to us over the summer. And if you've got any topics that you want me and T-Shirt to discuss uh, related to RPGs, um, then let him know and he can... Put it on the docket. Uh, speaking of antidepressants before, uh, summer is a bummer for me. I have inverse SADS, seasonal affective disorder. Um, when I was first diagnosed, it was the summer, way, way back in 2007. 
and it is Mental Health Awareness Month, so uh, I, I crave your tolerance if I'm slightly less chipper or not quite as active or not as available as I would prefer to be during this month. I also tend to find um, these mental health awareness months and things difficult because it's usually very surface level um, and, and my issues are beyond being a bit sad and uh, a little bit anxious from time to time and so a lot of the platitudes and uh, virtue signaling that goes on during such periods is in incredibly aggravating. Uh, we It seems like we've been raising awareness for the past at least five years, particularly with reference to men's mental health, uh, but nobody's really doing much of anything. And uh, with the government here recently announcing crackdowns on people claiming <clears throat> payment assistance, for mental health issues and forcibly shoving more people onto universal credit and um, taking you know wellness assessments even more away from doctors uh, it, it doesn't feel much like mental health awareness month <sighs> right on to the comments from the videos on iron claw second edition review Five of Hearts says, is the game stream still up? I can't find it. So, yes, we ran first edition revised um, or second printing or whatever it was of Iron Claw over on my streaming channel, which is Grim Streams. So if you want to see that or any of the other games that I have run as part of the Grim Game project or before, toddle on over to Grim Streams subscribe um, and then if you click on the live tab that will show you all the playbacks of all the games that we've played with varying degrees of quality um, what I aim for is what um, I, I aim for authenticity so you will find that our games tend to play out like real games do like sometimes people just aren't on Right, and sometimes we have to stop for a minute and look up a rule uh, if it's something crucial I can't just hand wave. Um, so you, you'll see it's not as telegenic, um, but if, if you head on over there, you will see the way games really are played with crosstalk, table talk, uh, tangents, nonsense, and so on. We, we even do that on... Um, on tabletopless and it's very important to me that we do even though the situation is not uh, normal or realistic for most groups there the the spirit of gaming you know being around a table with friends talking nonsense uh, and you know occasionally going off on tangents or being distracted i think that's part of the tabletop gaming experience so you'll see that on the tabletopless streams and you'll see that on my streams over on grim streams go and sub i would like to get that to a thousand as well so go over sub with all your accounts <laughs> paul berry says love your reviews what are your thoughts on greyhawk's corpse being reanimated as a possible setting for the 2024 dms guide uh so um D, D isn't as sacred to me as it is to a lot of other people uh, again i i didn't start with D, D. it doesn't have that that special place in my heart but i understand how it does for plenty of other people um so if i were really invested in greyhawk i would be very very worried um given what they've done to um things like uh, Spelljammer and Ravenloft oh, they massacred my boy um, so yeah I would be very very worried however if it's in the core book they won't have too much space to fuck it up and the players guides and DMs guides generally the setting is more implied 
than actually present per se in the books. So if they stick to the usual format and usual way of doing things, then it could be okay in that they're probably going to leave a lot of space open in it for you to interpret or place in older material as you wish. But this is Wizards, so they'll probably fuck it. Edward Kopp says, So, Yiffing, had to look it up. Oi. Please explain your dislike for campaign settings and intro adventures. As a world builder, I'm not sure if I'm insulted. Uh, please explain how the system is good for fantasy races, alternate reality dimensions where kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species have evolved and been magically created to be sentient bipedal beings isn't fantasy. Uh, I agree about species creation rules. That would be very helpful when one of your players shows up with some rare critter that is their heart's desire to play and you've never heard of it before. There could be templates of choices starting at phylum and work your way down to species. Uh, I'll play to give it a feel if you're running it again. Uh, if and when I run it again, which rhymes, which is pleasing, I, I will let you know. Um, the problem with campaign settings in many game books is unless the campaign setting is essential to the game, or unless it's the selling point of the game, most people are going to use a more genericized set of game rules to do their own thing, right? So all of that is wasted space. And if it's not an attention-grabbing, unique, interesting setting, you might be terribly excited about it. But if it's Adventures in the Land of Generica, it's it's just a waste of page count. Um, slim Slim the book down. Save me some money. On, on printing and shipping, please. I, I would much prefer. With intro adventures, uh, let's face it, most people who get introduced to the hobby for good or ill are doing it via a bare handful of systems. For anyone who is creating any other more independent games, most of your customers are already going to be aware of what a role-playing game is. Right, so they don't need that hand holding, they don't need an introductory adventure, and again, it's wasted space. Because if you've got monsters in your adventure, odds are they're going to be in your bestiary anyway, right? So, repeating them's unnecessary, and the adventure is something you're probably only going to use once and never again. So, again, that's another. Yeah, maybe maybe ten to twenty pages. That's a complete waste of time, or or an almost complete waste of time in in the best of circumstances. So again, save me, you know, a bob or two off, off the off the cover price, and and save me some of the shipping costs, please. Save the environment. Print smaller books. There's nothing wrong with campaign settings and adventures separately, right? Dark Sun, campaign setting, great. Ravenloft, as was, campaign setting, great. Spelljammer, as was, campaign setting, great. Um, you know, there are, there are other examples, and there are examples where the campaign setting is integral to the game, like uh, Rokugan in Legend of the Five Rings, for example. Um, the pseudo-Japanese culture and world that they present there is integral to the game system. Um, and to the appeal of the game. So it's it's not that I'm against campaign settings and intro adventures, it's just that for a lot of games, it's an unnecessary waste of space and thus an unnecessary expense and, and page padding. And 500 page monsters, <laughs> in terms of books, uh, not actual monsters, you know, take it, yeah, easy tiger, take it down a peg. <laughs> All right, unless you're really using every single page. On D&D &D visual storytelling, uh, Simon Skalka, I think, it's Polish, so. Uh, pastel and mush, he says. It doesn't just describe the art, but the writing and the attitude of 5e. Yeah, isn't the alternate cover to this new player's handbook like a dragon helping to brew coffee? Doesn't that just kind of 
say it all. Yeah. Pastel and mush. Yeah, it's yeah, it's more general than just the art. It's it's the whole attitude um, and the de-emphasis of the visceral combat is, you know, a thing. I was thinking back to the original uh, Warhammer Fantasy roleplay cover where you straight up have a have a dwarf murking an orc and you know black blood spilling out. <laughs> uh, it's a very busy cover. But it shows a, a party, and it shows the action, and it shows the blood and the and the gore. You'd never see that from from wizards or a lot of other companies these days. Uh, which also reminds me, I was watching Red Letter Media do like a, a roundup of movies and things that they've seen recently, and they went off on this huge tangent about Blumhouse films and how they're horror without horror. <laughs> and contrasting them with Roger Corman and yeah you know, when you watched a Roger Corman film you were probably going to see blood and tits <laughs> and it was a lot more entertaining because of it trying to do a G-rated horror film or U-rated here in the UK I guess it's kind of doomed to failure uh, but that seems to be the character of um, a lot of current entertainment with a few notable exceptions, uh, which are, oddly enough, usually quite successful. Uh, Mr. Welch says, you can easily explain the sight lines in the new player's handbook cover. There's an off-screen blink dog. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's the way you can make sense, I guess. Someone else said something about how uh, digital art coloring tends to uh, end up muddy. Uh, see, I find that more with traditional media than digital art. Um, but I've mostly encountered digital art in comics where mostly you're laying down fairly flat blocks of, of colour, uh, which keeps it somewhat vibrant, which you don't see in this. But the fact that you can revise and revise and revise and revise digital art may explain some of the, the mushiness. So that's something i guess uh db says i know you don't actually care because i said i don't care on the video um but here's some engagement for you artistic analysis as you call it is never ever bullshit once a work of art or a cultural product has left the studio or the workshop or the loving arms of its maker it takes on a life of its own it becomes an autonomous thing that can be interrogated analyzed vivisected read interpreted and or just plain talked about ad infinitum, as that is how a work of art or a cultural product continues to survive or stays a part of the discourse in general. The artist's intentions are only ever relevant while the work is in his or her hands. Once freed, the artist has no more say. That's the wager we make as artists. We gamble that we have said our piece, uh, and out there someone, somewhere someone will get it. This video is honestly a great one, both in keeping with your reviews and a way of broadening the discourse you engage in. So not bullshit at all. Um, I still disagree. If you want to know what a piece of art means or is intended to mean, the only person who has any definitive thing to say about that is the artist. Death of the author is bullshit. Um, ask the ghost of Isaac Asimov. Um, which doesn't mean you can't artistically analyse things, but all you're saying then... Um, even less so uh, th than the actual creator is this what it this is what it means to me this is how I feel about it this is what I see in it and your opinion is no more valid than anybody else's whereas what we see in a lot of artistic analysis today is people saying this is what it is you know this is about colonialism or this is racist or this is misogynist well that's just like your opinion man <laughs> right but these cultural critics in particular seem to think that their analysis is the only possible analysis that their opinion is the only possible opinion and then they wield power based upon that analysis uh, to get things banned or censored or controlled or limited or whatever it might be. So if we're saying that all analysis is basically bullshit, 
that's fine because then we acknowledge that those kind of analyses where they are, are wearing a particular lens when they look at it is you know just their opinion as well but if anyone has any real say over what a particular book game whatever is is intended to be what they were aiming for what meanings they were engineering into it if any yeah that's that's the creator that's the author that's the artist nobody else but yeah you no longer have control of things once they're out there but that's a subtly different sort of concern i think uh ajax plunkett says if what you say is even half correct and wizards are purposely blending the ordinary with the mundane with a dash of safe and boring non-controversial art and bland color palette they will no longer be the leader in the rpg sphere for gaming and game art anymore the company reminds me of an ex hard rock slash punk rocker who got older and just started churning out safe but viable pop hits but their soul is lost forever um i think that's true but however i i don't think D and D will ever cease being the leader. Right at the at the fag end of second edition, other games eclipsed it. During fourth edition, briefly here and there, Pathfinder eclipsed it. But Pathfinder's lost its way as well, I think. Um, and a lot of companies are producing relatively safe pablum uh, for people. Um, and that's sad, but it doesn't seem to afflict their sales enough to kill them off or to make them at least change course. Um, but I think I think we're entering another similar period for D&D at the moment where it's possible something could come up and eclipse it, but it doesn't seem particularly likely and it won't be the case for long, if at all. Uh, Wizard Jim says, The thing I always liked about old D&D art is that the party always seemed to be in peril. They had shocked expressions, knobbly knees. The situations depicted were usually oh shit moments. Newer art always seems to have them in control and confidently facing the challenges as if they're no big deal, which does tie into the steadily decreasing lethality of the game over the editions. Uh, yes, I, I would agree. Um, I mean, if you were to show the party in peril on a fifth edition cover uh if you had any experience of the game <laughs> beforehand um it would seem somewhat laughable uh and that doesn't seem to be what people want you know they don't want roger corman horror they want blumhouse quote horror unquote um yeah, overcoming doesn't seem to be what people want. Um, they seem to want to be in control and safe at all times, um, to the point where you know even the even the DM's role, the, the GM's role, is being eroded and undermined. Um, so there's a whole kind of philosophical thing going on. Um, Seems like these Gen Alpha kids might have a bit of the Gen X spirit as, as they grow up. People keep referring to them as feral. I'll believe it when I see it, but um, maybe there'll be a breath of fresh air. Who knows? On quite an old video on Catalyst Game Labs, Will C says, Progressive movements never stop progressing. None of it has value, just sheep. That's why LGBT will eventually add more letters for things that are illegal today, about which I guess he's implying bestiality and paedophilia um i don't consider these current social justice movements to truly be progressive because not all change is progress and not all progress is change um a lot of the free expression rights and so on that many of us fought so valiantly for uh, are being actively undermined by people who are calling themselves progressive but who threatened to roll back those kind of rights and that permissive tolerant society that you know we managed to claw for ourselves <laughs> from uh, the relatively conservative majority um progress does have value i think but it should be value in terms of options um 
yes a lot of these this new crop they are somewhat sheepy uh ovine i think is the is the word um and that's unfortunate uh, i think the slippery slope argument is uh, bollocks when it comes to lgbt but you know you have people who are equally problematic the other the other way who many conservatives on the more libertarian side would would equally disown the same way that I disown these these pseudo progressives. Um, we we we're getting the worst of both wings, I think, and both of them are pretty small c conservative, and that's static and rolling back, not actually making progress. Um, but as usual, America's political language is fucked. Uh, Kaloki plan. Let's do that in the middle a bit. Um, because reasons. Uh, Death Metal Dave says, Globalist elite agenda collapse society for profit and control. Which is barely a sentence. I'm not entirely sure what Death Metal Dave means there um but even the incredibly rich and powerful benefit from society and it doesn't seem to make a great deal of sense why they would collapse it um especially since so many of them depend on all this infrastructure and workers and all of this stuff to keep them comfortable so i had, i mean that was barely a sentence i don't really know what you mean um so i probably shouldn't speculate alex gold says they in brackets so you know he means jews paid this man to tell us the plan doesn't exist all right fuck chops get yourself a copy of the book there are translations I'm trying to get one that's just a translation of the book without white supremacist commentary garbage all over it read it through and then tell me where this plan is in that book Right, because that's what this video is about, and the same thing it's been about for all the years since I made it. It's about this specific conspiracy theory, this idea that Count Kudenhove Kalergi, uh, a mixed race um, Japanese German noble aristocrat, in, a, in effect, laid out a plan in the book Practical Idealism. Uh, which suggests like forcibly making people interbreed and uh, raising up Jews as some sort of controlling ubermensch or, or something. It, it does no such thing whatsoever. It's some observations by a man in the interwar period who was right about some things and wrong about a whole lot of others, but it's just his observations and suggestions and ideas and argues for things like a united Europe, which was one of the more prescient things he got pretty right. So yeah, n and nobody, unfortunately, is paying me to say anything. Um, and it's weird that these white supremacists don't just offer me more money, because any amount of money is more than none. If you think what I say is so easily bought by mysterious figures in the background, why not just pay me more to be your mouthpiece? Oh, that's right. You're all unemployed losers. Not to say that everybody who's unemployed is a loser, but these are both unemployed and losers, and probably unemployed because they're racist fucks. Caesar3909 says, Just ran into a thread about this on Twitter. Believers of this conspiracy have... have somehow combined their anti-semitism and racism into one belief the main idea is that there is somehow a plan concocted by jews to have white women procreate and have families with black men across the western world that's where it stops they have no end goal about this uh, the hatred is simply for the idea of people of differences being together specifically black men and white women which they call biological genocide which is why they despise mixed black kids the most uh, they have memes about this and stuff. I think people who believe this are either insane or insecure about their standing in the world. Well, that kind of goes without saying. But of course, uh, Count Kudenhove Kalergi was not Jewish. Uh, he married a, Jew a Jewish woman, but he was German and Japanese uh, by descent. So, 
I think most of the wingnuts that come here and comment on the Kalergi video, I think they don't watch the video um, at all. And I don't think they understand the different strands of, of this conspiracy theory. Um, because they'll do things like say, oh, but look at all the immigration. All right, well, let's just take it as read that there is a, a, as big an amount of immigration as they say there is. Let's just, you know, take that for granted. That doesn't mean there's a plan, does it? <laughs> and it doesn't mean that Count Kudenhove Kalergi uh, wrote out in his book, you know, 100 years ago, you know, this this is what we do, right? We uh, we destabilize the the Middle East and uh, we create ecological problems across Africa, uh, and then that creates a whole bunch of refugees uh, that we let into our countries. Yeah, you know, nowhere does he say that. And the conspiracy theory, specifically that I am addressing, is that Count Kudenhove Kalergi laid out some sort of plan in practical idealism to subvert and control society through the immigration and I I don't know fucking black girls or something <laughs> what <sighs> Uzumaki Naruto Naruto racists that's just what we needed why don't you Naruto run to Russia fuck chucks uh, whether or not there's an actual conspiracy or plan to replace white people in their own nations, it is happening, slowly but surely. Can't deny the fact that the percentage of white people in their own countries is slowly going downwards while the amount of minorities in Western nations are going up significantly. Well, I can, but we'll get to that. This is especially true in a country like Canada, where its government decided it was perfectly fine to bring in one plus million new foreigners into their country in 2022 and 2023. I don't know how anyone can look at increasing your population by nearly 5% over the last couple of years with mostly non-white people as not being concerning and not thinking that something was going on here. Also, while I agree the ease of travel and communication has brought people more together and makes the mixing of different races and ethnicities much more easy than ever before, one question I have, have you ever seen diversity and race mixing being pushed so hard and so consistently as it has been in Western nations, especially in places like Canada, the US, UK, etc.? When's the last time you've seen an Islamic or an Africa or an Asian nation where once government and the media has promoted diversity and the intermixing of races as hard and as often as they do in the West? Can you name one? I certainly can't. I just find it interesting that this happens so much in the West and pretty much nowhere else in the world. Can you explain why this is the case? Uh, yes, we're more progressive, more developed, more advanced, more tolerant and just plain better than everybody else, which is why we're multicultural. Anyway, uh, so Canada, um, it's over the period that he describes, so 2022 to 2023, it's only about 800,000 uh, supposed immigrants into Canada. Uh, that's gross, not net, right? So he's estimating 2 million over those two years and the actual number is less than half of that and that's the gross not the net in terms of net migration that is people who go there and stay it is about six people per 1000 people per year in Canada and has been fairly steadily around six per 1000 each year for a very long time Canada has a relatively small population spaced out over a relatively large area and for it to continue to compete and grow as an economy it needs more people and like most western nations we we ain't fucking as much as we used to or at least not having kids as much as we used to uh, which is something that always happens in countries as they get wealthier but because we need more people, workers, especially as our populations age, particularly the baby boom bubble, uh, you, know, you need more people. So we need people, other people 
want to leave their home nations, whether they're economically depressed, whether they have strife, civil war, ecocide, all manner of other problems, you know, they need somewhere to go or they want somewhere to go and people naturally migrate just as they have since we all left Africa. So is the percentage of white people in our countries going downwards? Very slightly, very slowly. Are the amount of minorities going up? Yes, very slightly, very slowly. And um, that doesn't mean there's some scheme. It just means that there are certain geopolitical uh, and environmental forces and our economics demands it. Uh, we, we can't have that infinite growth the neoliberals love so much without importing some population to do the jobs that most of us don't want to do or can't do. Right, there's there's nothing sinister about that. Also, race mixing isn't being pushed. What they mean by this is they've seen an advert with a mixed family in it. And what's actually happening there is the advertisers trying to hit as many demographics as possible. Right? So you typically have uh, the country's racial majority as one half of the couple, a minority as the other half of the couple, mixed race children, probably some friends who are from some other ethnicities. What's going on there? They want to sell to as many people as possible. So they want to target all those different ethnicities. That's it. It's just money. There is no sinister agenda behind it. It's just, you know, they've got to hit all the quadrants when they're trying to sell shit. Um, did I miss anything else? Oh, this being pushed in other countries. Well, it's not being pushed here, um, but it, it doesn't happen in other countries because a lot of other countries are the places people are leaving from or they're xenophobic. But even Japan has begun to loosen its immigration because it has to economically, right? Despite their history of xenophobia and the way they treat foreigners there quite often, right? So... I mean, none of this is a mystery. Why are you struggling so much with it that you have to make up conspiracies? <sighs> Jay Hooley says, a uh, rich person predicted something to happen and then it happened. The, yeah, when you make an accurate prediction, that's that's how things go. Look, uh, I, I predict this dice will fall when I let go of it and will rattle on the table. Gee, I must have somehow engineered that with some grand conspiracy. Gravity is all a conspiracy by English game designers so that dice can be rolled effectively. God, get fucked. <sighs> anyway, what did he say? Uh, yeah, Western world societies are getting stuffed over with a whole bunch of illegal immigrants running through while the government either ignores it or lays out the red carpet. Are you dumb? Um, so illegal immigrants are a very small minority of immigrants. Um, in our country, uh, at least in order to claim asylum, you have to immigrate illegally because there are no legal routes. But uh, And they're not exactly rolling out the red carpet, are they? Banging people up in prison barges and uh, doing all kinds of other pointless shit against a tiny minority of immigration to appease racists like you while at the other side of their mouth they acknowledge that we need immigration to keep the economy going and so they're making legal routes easier constantly and are you dumb and that's, that that's a rhetorical question um damn it and rhetorical means you're not supposed to answer right you, you know it's just the answer is assumed. Uh, the Irish volunteer, and god damn it's sad to see the Irish succumb to racism, given how often they were emigres to all manner of places around the world um, to get out from under the British boot heel, or the English boot heel I should say. The Irish volunteer says, looking through your comments I can see you're a Zionist apologist, and don't confuse that between Jewish either. Um, I don't see 
how I am. Um, I have plenty of criticisms of the Jewish state, but I do tend to find that Zionism is a bit of a Schrodinger's thing. Uh, racists will retreat to Zionism or progress from Zionism into anti-Semitism. And anti-Semitism is racism, and racism is bad, whether it's against white people, brown people, black people, whatever. Racism's bad. Racism against Jews is bad. Historically, it has been particularly bad. Um, I think, like a lot of idiots, you're confusing my clumsy attempts to understand the situation and express the nuances of it for support, which it isn't. Uh, the Irish volunteer goes on to make two other comments, the first one of which is, Why are you deleting people's comments? Many of mine have just gone after our debate. I am battling with YouTube algorithms and you as well. I've seen this activity all through the threads. Why is it those who giggle at others' knowledge can't take criticism themselves? Well, knowledge, that's a bold claim. Uh, I'm going <laughs> to citation fucking needed there. Uh, I generally don't delete comments or ban people or block them um, unless they are just being aggressive and insulting or unless they're spamming, which plenty of people have in the past. So that might be why you see gaps. Some people start off nicely enough uh, and then ramp up to spam and posting multi-page screeds into comments and shit like that and ain't nobody got time for that um, but I don't generally speaking delete comments it's a pretty high bar YouTube however does mostly it deletes things that are someone being outrageously and egregiously racist or someone who is spamming links to particularly to racist sites so if you are getting blocked and deleted by YouTube, I suggest you try rephrasing and taking out any links that you may have put in. Because a lot of the time, this stuff doesn't even end up in my check this content box. He goes on to say, yet again, this was deleted. No, weren't me, Gov. I will edit. It's only delusional because you see it that way. That was me describing what a conspiracy theory is and means. You obviously just skimmed over the surface of the things you mentioned without real investigation of the science behind it. There is no science behind it. Check out A&E for 911 Truth. Of course you didn't just fall for one stupid moronic conspiracy theory, did you? It's like people's brains break and then all the nonsense just floods in. Of course you've never heard of it. So all those architects and engineers are talking BS, but you know better. Uh, go and look up Project Dave and uh, then come back. On D&D's basic bitch, Judd Goswick says, No one is talking about how everyone discussing this just assumed the opposition's monster type. This is the kind of NPCist null whistle I've come to expect from modern gamers. What if the foe struggles with people not, ex not accepting its bullet self? You've been on a bit of a bit of a roll there in the comments, Judd. That was quite funny. <laughs> uh, Diogenes Students says, You are the exact man that King Cobra JFS wants to become. This comment or similar has been left by a lot of people, and I know I could just Google it, but I, I want to have you explain to me who or what the fuck is King Cobra, and are these constant comparisons an insult or a compliment and why do people keep saying it uh, on bears uh, user string of letters and numbers says as a martial arts instructor for over 30 years uh, I took more than a casual interest in statistics related to violent crime you were correct in that the vast majority of people will never be victims and simply learning and exercising situational awareness drops the odds statistically close to zero of course, it's not zero, and no one wants to hear that, or that most victims put themselves in harm's way through criminality or stupidity. Yeah, I just blamed the victim. Sure, bad things do happen to innocent people, but not as often as people seem to wish. For some reason, people want their fear fed and validated, even if that means ignoring facts, lying to themselves, and never doing anything actually useful to protect themselves if lightning strikes and they actually do fall victim. There's something strangely appealing to living in irrational fear and aligning oneself with victims, 
even going as far as to exaggerate or lie about personal experiences in order to be a part of some victim cult. That's not to say there aren't truly innocent victims, of course there are, but this stuff too often takes on the aspects of a social contagion as people rush to virtue signal and have their fearful feelings stroked and willful ignorance treated like virtues and wisdom. Yeah, I agree with most of that. Um, I think... So this is true of me, and I think it's true of a lot of men as well. Our coping mechanism is often to distance ourselves from emotion and to intellectualize problems and to examine them um, on a rational basis, on a, on a logical basis. Certainly for me, uh, that was the only good thing I took from cognitive behavioral therapy and it was a defensive behavior on my part as well. So yeah, an emotional reaction might exist but it is recognized as being irrational and then you switch to analytical mode and figure out whether that fear is warranted or not and then that provides you a way to control and or overcome that fear whereas it seems like and i'm not saying by any means all but it seems like a lot of women are encouraged to embrace their irrational fears uh, they are validated, not examined critically, not not undermined by facts. Um, and the bear thing very much seems like that <laughs> to me. Um, and so any sort of challenge saying, hang on, wait a minute, your odds of being attacked by a, a random strange dude that you happen across in the woods are practically zero. Uh, whereas your risk when you run into a bear is considerably higher this doesn't make any sense you know that scene is somehow being pro-sexual assault or something I, d I don't know there's there's no there's no logical progression here and you can acknowledge that someone is afraid and you can say yeah it's fine you're afraid maybe you've had some bad life experiences or whatever but here's the truth as a tool, as a way of controlling you and overcoming your fear. But people don't want that. Um, and that's where I think the disconnect is for a, a lot of people. On my Fabula Ultima review, Cyber Merlin says, Great video. I enjoy the game. I only have one small thing that bothered me. To play with the concept of limit breaks from Final Fantasy, I did have to purchase the Atlas. Uh, that's the High Fantasy Atlas. Uh, and Zero Powers. I did not mind purchasing the extra book. I just feel that the title made it hard for someone to know it was another source of optional rules. Yeah, I bought that as well. Uh, there will be a review at some point, probably next week. Um, of course, that was before I found out that apparently the people behind Fabula Ultimate are not keen on me and don't like my name being <laughs> mentioned on their Discord, even though I gave them you know, a massively high score uh, for what is a, is a good game. So... I don't know, I try to separate art from creators, so maybe I'll still pick up some more Fabula Ultima stuff. It's an interesting game. On four candles, ten candles, uh, Skullmerus says, I think you were far too generous to this game. I've tried the game because the idea of playing a tragic horror game by candlelight is cool, but it just doesn't function. There are way too many mechanics that just get in the way of the story. There's far too much game to be played over the lifetime of a tea candle. Well, several tea candles. Uh, the fact that all the candles tend to go out right about the same time means that the ending is always extremely rushed. Um, they space out the candles, but how long they burn for is somewhat random. So I don't know that that's true unless you lit them all at the same time. Uh, which is weird. Um, the established one true thing has no limits, and every game there is either a player trying to get away with something ludicrous, or the GM vetoes even reasonable stuff. But more importantly, the game fails at its primary function. The player characters don't know they're going to die, so you never actually explore the themes of hopelessness and accepting the end. Instead, you get a fairly standard task-oriented survival horror ending with a cheap and unearned death at the end that makes everything you did pointless. A terrible game. I would have far preferred just doing a freeform game by candlelight with no mechanics at all. 
And that's fair enough to the extent that it's fair enough. I was generous to it because I find the way it goes about things interesting. I find the ritualistic nature of it interesting. And it's daring and tries to do something different, um, which is very worthwhile. Plus, it's not just a Powered by the Apocalypse clone or, or, or whatever. So if I was generous, it's probably because I was reviewing it from a jaded game designer's perspective. Uh, Marzakin says, just letting it be known that I really enjoyed the opening and the lighting slash mood of this review. Excellent. Well, some people didn't <laughs> and made that known, but given there wasn't really much in the way of art or anything in the book, uh, I made a, an aesthetic choice uh, trying to evoke something of the feeling that they're probably aiming for with the game. Whether I succeeded or not, I don't know. Patrick Standart says, a beautiful game system for what it is, very group dependent, but with the right group, it's awesome. Uh, yeah, that's the, that's the real trick, I think. You have to get the right group that's properly committed to the whole thing and is suitably pretentious, that they don't feel self-conscious <laughs> with such a game. Um, also, for what is probably a one-shot, it's going to be difficult to make people familiar enough with the game system that it just kind of flows, really. Uh, Beetle just says, you should just make a video about what is wrong with 6 on a D6 or why you hate a 16.67% chance so we can move on this topic as it's getting annoying on every video. Um, I can do, but basically what it boils down to is you would think if you need a 6 on a D6, if you roll 6 dice, then you're pretty much assured of success, right? So that would be a level of expertise that should guarantee you success. Only it doesn't. It's only about a two-thirds chance. That that is the basic basis of the of the problem, um, and the ways in which the systems try to get around it are all kludges. So it doesn't really work. William Baldwin says, "Seems like a balanced enough review. Where can I get a copy?" Uh, that's the neat part. You can't. Well, you can, but it takes ages. Uh, you can get it from cavalrygames.com but it takes ages to get posted out to you wherever you are. Whether that's brilliant marketing through scarcity or silly, I don't know. On Baptism of Fire, Simon Skolker says, nice pronunciation. Poland had some of the most hardcore medieval battles. Just check out Grunwald. Uh, Crusaders is an old school 60s Polish film that goes into the defeat of the Teutonic Knights. Another great one is Fire and Sword, set in the 17th century. It has one of the most realistic sword fights you'll see at the start. Perfect for Lamentations of the Flame Princess. So check that out if you're interested. Uh, Vidgrip says, thank you for including a mention of font size in your review. Now I'm off to have a bowl of cromflakes. Yeah, that seems to tickle people. It's not the first time I've made that joke, but people seem to pick up on it this time. Um, and while we're on the cromflakes, uh, Redfield says... If they're not good, don't complain about it. He will not listen. Uh, Judd Goswick, who's been on a tear this week, uh, says, count the flakes, Crom, count the flakes. And what is the riddle of milk? Uh, <coughs> that'll do it. See you soon. Zang. About 3,000 of you subscribe, but only about 200 are getting notifications. So click the bell and click all.